Good evening, Island Park. Hope this finds you having a fantastic and happy kind of Wednesday. It's a blessing to be back with you tonight as we continue our study in Joshua. We're going to be in the last part of Joshua 8, the last six verses, 30 through 35, and we're going to touch on the topic of renewal. Before I start, as always, please make sure you pick up that prayer sheet that Amy so faithfully sends out to you. Make sure you include that in your daily prayers and lift our brothers and sisters up in Christ. Let's uh, continue to share and rejoice with them in their joys and, and to help them carry their burdens as they walk through this crazy time in the world, all right? I'm going to pray for us, and then we will read our text and dig into our study tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is and a privilege it is to be able to freely gather together in your name, to be able to freely gather together to to study your word, to grow ourselves and continually conform ourselves into the image that you have created us to be. But Father, we can't do that without your help. We can't do that without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we, we cry out to the Spirit today, Father, to open our eyes, to let us see, to open our ears and let us hear, to change and impact our lives with the power of your word. Father, I pray that that you would use a, an old fart like me, Father, just to, uh, to preach and teach your word, that you would set me aside, that you would speak through the powerful word and the Bible that you have given us, Father, that in a manner that would transform lives, would conform people to your will, to your plans, and allow them, allow us to be obedient to your plans for our lives. Father, speak through your word tonight. Impact us and change us for your glory, for your praise. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, if you would, follow along with me, and I'm going to go ahead and start off and just read our verses, Joshua 8, verses 30 through 35. At that time, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal to the Lord, the God of Israel, just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites. He built it to, according to what is written in the book of law of Moses an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool has been used. Then they offered burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings on it. There on the stones, Joshua copied the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the Israelites. All Israel, resident alien and citizen alike, with their elders, officers, and judges, stood on either side of the ark of the Lord's covenant, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded earlier concerning the blessings of the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read aloud all the words of the law, the blessings as well as the curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, the dependents, and the resident aliens who lived among them. Small sampling tonight for us, six verses, but so, so much in these six verses, and I pray we can do it justice as we dig into it tonight. You know, I don't, I don't think I'm much different from most of you men that are, that are sitting out there tonight. I'm typical, uh, meaning I'm not really fond of using plans or directions in my lifetime. There have been countless numbers of times in my life where I have been uh, out shopping, brought home a grill or a piece of furniture or something of that nature, bring it home, set it down, open it up only to promptly discard the plans and I start putting it together as I think it should go. And I can't tell you how many times I have finished something only to look back where the pile of supplies are and wonder, wow, what are all those extra parts for? Why did they give me that extra bar? And, and why are all these extra screws? And what's that big plate for? I didn't need it when I put it together. Um, and there have been many times in doing that that I put something together trying to follow the picture, only to get it three-quarters of the way together and have to take it apart and start all over again because the part I was trying to put on needed to be put on way in the beginning. Um, each time that I did it, it was wrong. Why? Because quite simply, I didn't follow the plans. I just look at the picture. I ask myself, what's the next step? Which direction do I need to go in order to get that accomplished? And you know, to be honest, I think that's the question maybe the Israelites 
were asking themselves that were at this point in the text. They had just finished the conquest of the city of Ai, and, and they're, they're chomping at the bit. Um, they have defeated Jericho because of God's grace and God's power. Ai has fallen because of God's grace and God's power, and they're asking themselves, what's the next steps? What's the next part for the process for us to get this land that God has promised to us? And I, I specifically said some of them because I don't think that's what Joshua was asking himself. I don't think Joshua was wondering what the next step was. You see, Joshua had the plans. He knew exactly what needed to be done. And what's better for Joshua is he actually used the plans. He, he picked them up and followed them intimately. Every I was dotted, every T was crossed. Um, we, when we use the plans that are given to put our grills together, our furniture, or to live our Christian lives, we place our hands in the one that created those things. We, we place our hands, quite honestly, in the expert. And when we use the plans to live our lives as Christians the way we should, we place our hands in the creator who created humanity, who knows our ins and out, who knows our weakness, um, knows exactly what makes us tick. And, and our creator knows exactly what we were created for and what our purpose is. And he knows why it has to be done exactly as it has, plan has been planned. If you remember, go all the way back to Joshua 1.8 and listen to what it said in our opening book. It says, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. See, Joshua not only had the master plan, he not only had the book that laid out everything that he needed to know in order to be successful, to be obedient to God's plan, he had the perfect script and he followed the script in detail. He had zero doubt as to what would come next for the nation of Israel. Go with me, turn one book back, and, and we'll look at what Joshua is reading that gives him this confidence to be able to follow it. Let's look at Deuteronomy 27, and listen to verses 1 through 8 here. Deuteronomy 27, verses 1 through 8 says, Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, Keep every law, keep every command I am giving you today. When you cross the Jordan into the land the Lord your God is giving you, set up large stones and cover them with plaster. Write all the words of this law on the stones after you cross in to enter to the land the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. When you have crossed the Jordan, you are to set up these stones on Mount Ebal, as I am commanding you today, and you are to cover them with plaster. Build an altar of stones there to the Lord your God. Do not use any iron tool on them. Use uncut stones to build an altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God on it. There you are, you are to sacrifice fellowship offerings, eat, and rejoice in the presence of the Lord your God. Write clearly all the words of this law plastered with stones. Come down and read verses 12 and 13 because they're pertinent to us as well. It says, when you have crossed the Jordan, these tribes will stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these tribes will stand on Mount Ebal to deliver the curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And it says that the Levites will proclaim them in a loud voice to every people. There is so much direction in what we just read. You see, after they entered the promised land, they are to make their way uh, warp through the promised land to Mount Ebal where they are to write all of God's words down, uh, God's words of the law. They are to write them down on stones. And the stones are supposed to be coated with plaster for the people. An altar is supposed to be built. And on that altar, they are going to offer their burnt offerings and then they're going to offer their fellowship offerings that they make to the Lord. And then they are to assemble the tribes. Six are supposed to be on Mount Ebal and six are supposed to be on Mount Gerzim, and they're supposed to recite the blessings and the curses. Those are the plans that were given in Deuteronomy 27 that we find Joshua completing in our text tonight. And not a step is missed as Joshua goes through these and he fills them out. There's going to be no shortcuts 
at all in this text because it is, as verse 131 says, just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites. Joshua was intimate on detail because he had the plans and he followed the plans that he needed to do. Follow the plan. I think that's the message that we see in our text right off the bat as we start off our study tonight. You see, Mount, Mount Gerzim and Mount Ebal stand opposite of each other. And after God gave them the victory at Ai and the Israelites, they all travel to the valley of Shechem, which just so happens to be right in the middle of these two mountains. Um, and it's the same place that was described by Moses earlier. Go back to Deuteronomy 11, and let's look at 29 and 30. And it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim the blessings at Mount Gerzim and the curse at Mount Ebal. Aren't these mountains across the Jordan, beyond the western road in the land of the Canaanites who live in Arabia, opposite Gilgah, near the Oaks of Mor? So this was uh, preordained and planned by God and given out a long time ago. And Moses describes this for us all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 11. So we need to understand that none of this, none of what we read tonight and we study in, in verses 30 through 35 is by chance. And you have to understand the attention to all the details that is involved in exactly what's going on here. Um, if you go back and research and do some look, <coughs> look into the history of it, Mount Ebal was a barren, destitute, and rocky place. <coughs> Excuse me. It's where they would find all the stones that they would need in order to build the altar as they were sacrificing and offering their burnt offerings. Now, Mount Gerzim, which was opposite of it, was a lush, wooded, tropical paradise filled with fruit. And that is where they would recite the blessings. Do you see the details? How it all mixes and how it all fits together in, in a manner that only God could cause it to fit together? Even the characteristics of the land. Uh, Mount Ebal, which is destitute, barren, and rocky, and Mount Gerzim, which is lush and wooded and fruitful. Even the characteristics of the land are going to add to the message that the law would proclaim when they recite the law, that there's only two ways to live. And those ways each carry uniquely different consequences. You know, it's going to be a powerful message as they recite the message and, and go back through the law. It's a message that has stood the test of time throughout the years. And it's a message that we would do well to heed and to listen to today. You know, we know from what we read in Deuteronomy that God had commanded <coughs> Moses that these events should take place as soon as they get into the promised land. So I know some of you out there have questions. Well, they didn't do this as soon as they got into the promised land. Well, why not? Were they disobedient? And the problem was where they were going, check them. Both Jericho and the city of Ai lay right in the path. So both of those two major obstacles had to be taken care of before they could get into the promised land in order to take care of what God had spoken of through Moses. There was that de delay from the initial defeat at Ai, and that defeat also alienated God from his people. Um, so before they can go on and before they can go any further, there needs to be a renewal of that relationship. And that renewal started with the judgment that was passed upon Achan, but now we're at a point where there needs to be a national renewal, where the entire nation of Israel needs to renew the covenant with their Lord, on whom everything depends as they continue to take the land that the Lord their God has given them. But God is also, and has always been, as we have walked through this, moving in grace towards his people, and that order is important for us. Um, they need to renew the covenant, and God is going to extend grace. And then we look at it, we see that same order, because in verse 31 in our text, we find the sacrifice, the burnt offerings come first, and then the sacrificial fellowship offerings come second, and then they do the reading of the law the blessing as well as the curses will pop up. And the entire assembly of Israel in verse 35, as we're talking and we're reading, it says, not a word that all of Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including women, dependents, and the resident aliens who live there. 
as we have walked through Joshua and made it thus far, uh, they're in the process as they're going to build another altar. And it's almost become commonplace for us now as we've walked through to look at uh, the idea of monuments or physical markers that the nation of Israel will build as monuments, as testimonies to God's faithfulness, as, as testimonies to things wh of what not to do in their life. There were the stones in the river that Joshua built. There were the 12 stones that the men would carry into the first camp they had at Gilgah. There were the stones that were over Achan after they had burnt his entire family and his body. And then there were stones over the late king Ai of someone who would be defiant in the face of the Lord. But this time, this marker is a, is a drastically different marker that the nation of Israel is going to set up. Here, the everlasting law is made visible for the nation in written form to where they can see it. We have to understand that what Joshua kept as a personal private possession, most likely given to him by Moses, now becomes available for the entire nation of Israel to see and to read. You almost get a feeling from this, from the public reading of the law as they stand here in, in our text tonight, that it's a proclamation that this land belongs to God and that these are the only terms by which you can possess this land and the only terms by which you can actually enjoy this land. And it's not just that, but there's, there's so much more richness that's in this. Go all the way back with me to, to Genesis 12. And let's uh, look at verses 7 and 8. It says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country, east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Familiar territory, right? He built an altar to the Lord there, and he called on the name of the Lord. And if you go one chapter over, chapter 13, go to verse 18, it says, So Abram moved his tent and went to Lerib near the oaks of Mamre in Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Quite often, as we look back through the Old Testament, altar building was provoked by theopanies or, or presences, a visible manifestation or a visible presence of God. Then the patriarchs would build altars to the Lord and they would offer them. And the altar that Abraham built were symbolic of the patriarchs who were strangers in, in a foreign land. They were sojourners. They were visitors there. And they were laying claim to the land that God had promised to give them down the road. And as this altar that we read about in Joshua 30 through 35 is built on Mount Ebal, it's a visible demonstration, and hear this, that God's faithfulness has come to pass. It's come to fruition. The land that God promised Abram all the way back in Genesis is being given to them. The land is theirs, and it's still a, another sign for them as they look at this altar with the words on it of God's faithfulness, that whatever God says comes to fruition and the land is actually there. And there's more for us as we look at the offerings. And, and it, we got to listen to this because first the altar is built at the place where the curses are going to be pronounced, right? The altar is built on, on Mount Ebal. That's why we see the burnt offering come up in verse 31 first. Listen, it says, Just as Moses, the, uh, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites, he built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool has been used. They offered burnt offerings to the Lord. Burnt offerings are first. It's the first thing that comes up. Um, that's where the curses are pronounced. Do you, do you remember back in Leviticus when it talks about offerings when the sacrificial system first started? Burnt offerings were at the very, very top of the list. Go all the way back to Leviticus 1 and listen to what verses 1 through 4 says. It says, If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance of the tent of the meeting so he can be accepted by the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Why? Hear this. So it can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. 
atonement had to be made. It, it would cleanse him of his sins. It would renew his relationship and right his relationship with the Lord. And these sacrifices come first because they deal with the covenant breaking, the residual effects of breaking covenant with the Lord. The atoning sacrifice that we're talking about here that they do first, the burnt offerings, removes the guilt and it reestablishes that right relationship between a repentant nation and their sovereign Lord. And it's only, it's only after atonement is done and reestablished that you can offer the fellowship offering and you can restore the fellowship. And the fellowship offering has the same requirement as you read through the text. It has to be without spot or blemish, without wrinkle. They place their hand upon the animal's head, but this time it's a voluntary act of worship. Um, and it's born out of thanksgiving, of a restored relationship with God and, and other brothers and sisters that are around you. And, and it includes a communal meal where everyone that would participate and everyone that was covered can sit down and feast on part of the animal that was offered. So hear this now. First, righteousness has to be established. People have to be made right. And then fellowship can occur. And that theme is prevalent. Throughout the Old Testament, as we look at the Old Testament, there can be no fellowship with God nor his children except on the basis of righteousness, except on the basis of being made right with God, of being atoned for. And I think our entire passage tonight that we look at in Joshua 30 through 35 is a testimony of God's faithfulness to his people. And, and, and think about it. It's, the location is inside the promised land. It's the land that he promised to give to his people. It has a spiritual purpose of renewed fellowship with God and the blessings that follow, and they all testify and they scream to the fact that God is on point. He's on target and on pace with his plans that he set in motion before the world began. And his plans are to multiply and bless his people. And his people are now in the promised land reaping those blessings. But there's a catch for the nation of Israel here. Israel must, as they go through this, recommit to the covenant obligations. And that's what all the covenant blessing came on. Everything is there. I mean, as they go through this, everything is there. It's all waiting just to, to be gained. The ark of the Lord's covenant is there. God's presence in the midst of his people and it's symbolic for us that he is the center of their entire lives and everything that they have. And the fact that they're gathered there in the land that God promised to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15 is a testimony to his faithfulness. And the people own it and they possess it and they are expanding. And this promise was made so long ago. So it screams for something to rejoice at, something to be thankful at. at. So... So in this, as they do this, and I believe that there was a, a strong sense of joy and a strong sense of thankfulness in these fellowship offerings um, after the burnt offerings. Because not only has God promised, but God has accomplished by his sovereign will and by his purpose, and he has accomplished it. Hear this now, despite Achan and despite his disobedience, God's word and his promises still prevail. The victories they have seen have been powerful. They have been complete, um, and they are going to need those, and they are going to need to think about those as they prepare for the coming things that God has in store for them as they continue to take the land and to, to uh, continue the conquest. And understand, who needs to hear? Who needs to hear the, the book of this law as they read the entirety of the book of the law that, that is written out. And listen to verse 33. It says, all Israel, resident alien and citizen alike, with their elders, officers, and judges. And then in verse 35, it says, including women, the dependents, and the resident aliens who live among them. They don't need to just hear some of it and zone out. And I have been guilty of that before, and I know other brothers and sisters who have been guilty of that. But listen to verse 34. It says, Joshua read aloud all the words of the law. It goes on to say he read the blessings as well as the curses. Each individual 
And don't think that this is just for Joshua and the nation of Israel, but each individual that is there has a responsibility to be obedient in terms of the covenant. And at this point, neither gender nor age nor ethnicity can be used as an excuse or a cause for exception why we don't have to be obedient to the covenant terms. And I believe the point behind this, the point of renewing the covenant and the terms of reading the blessings and the curses just screams to us, and we don't want another Achan. We don't want to lose another member of our fellowship because of disobedience. So we need to pay attention and listen as the word of the law is read. Because inevitably, unfortunately, somebody's going to miss something. But if I miss something and you catch it and you see me doing something I shouldn't, you can reach over and go, Ed, then we were told we can't do that. And there's an accountability that screams out, we don't want to have to go through what we went through with Aiken before. You know, we're not, as we go through this, no matter how many times I read it, we weren't given any insight onto the, into the people's response. No telling. But I think we can understand that there was absolutely no doubt as exactly what was required of them and how they were to live from this point forward in order to live lives that were pleasing to God. And I have to believe, as they went through this, that the major thing was the blessings that the people would receive. And, and yes, and I hear some of you now, yeah, the, cur the curses were, were read, and they have to be listened to as well since they're the opposite side of the covenant relationship, and they happen when unfaithfulness sets in, when disobedience sets in. But I don't think they're the main point of what the people were to hear, just as avoidance of the curses shouldn't be our main motivation, or, or avoidance of going to hell shouldn't be our main motivation. The blessings here that they read aloud were designed to win the nation's affections, so that obedience would have been a natural response of their thankfulness. It just would have flowed from them. In, in our terms, I guess if you wanted to say it nowadays, you, we could say just, just look at what can be yours. If you truly love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and then express that love that you have by trusting him completely and being obedient to him regardless of what he calls you or asks you to do. I think that was the main emphasis then. And I think that's the main emphasis even for us today as Christians as we live our lives. Right? I mean, we're caught up in a world that wants to be self-sufficient. I can't tell you how many people I run into. We don't want to have to trust, or we don't want to have to depend upon anybody else. Just this past Sunday in Sunday school, we were talking about if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. I mean, that's a, a prevalent phrase in today's society. My opening statement, I don't need plans. I don't want to help. I know how to do it, and I've proven again and again and again that I don't know how to do it, that I do need plans, and that I do need help. But the society says that we want to run our lives in our own way and live in the manner that we want to live. And when we do that, and when we don't want help, we don't want uh, God stepping in, we don't want to be obedient to his plans, we create a plethora of idols in our life. But behind each and every idol that we create, it, there's only one idol. And it's the idol of self, ruling our lives with false confidence and taking pride in our rebellion against our Creator. And when that kind of thinking sets in, that we don't need anybody else, I can do this on my own, um, obedience then becomes something that, that's hated, something that is abhorred, and it becomes a nasty word for us. Yeah, I, I don't know about most of you, but one of the biggest songs that I heard on the radio growing up, um, I, I think I heard it first by Frank Sinatra, was My Way. Um, it's been redone by countless artists throughout the years. It's even been redone today and sung by more modern artists. But one of the main repeating verses in that is, I did it my way. Through it all, I stood tall and did it my way. Through it all, I'm, I'm arrogant, I'm proud. I did it, and I did it my way. And I, sadly, I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, that is the, uh, a large population of the world today. So when, when people come to Christ, when those individuals, anyone lost, comes to Christ, there is a ton of reprogramming that needs to go on inside the individual. You see, Jesus can be Savior 
because Jesus is Lord. But there are some today that want to downplay that, that fundamental fact, that, that almost a creed of our Christian faith, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because we say that so callously, care, cavalierly sometimes, it just flows out that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, many today want to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, and they want to expect all the blessings that come from forgiveness and fellowship, but they want to live out their daily lives without Jesus as Lord, without Jesus ruling their lives, without being obedient to everything that Christ has said. And that's not only inconsistent, but it's impossible to do. You can't be saved by Christ unless you allow Christ to rule your life. You can't be rescued by Jesus unless you're under his rule. It, it, it doesn't work. And maybe our problem today for Christianity today is that we just don't think in covenant terms enough. You know, we're, we're happy um, and we are so set on being individuals that we think as Christ works is primarily there to bless me, to allow me to be happy and to continue my cause because, hey, I give you some of my time and I'm there and I come to church on Sunday. But if we have that view, if anyone has that view, we have to be honest with ourselves and understand that the blessings are only flowing one way. They only flow from Jesus Christ's work on the cross at Calvary into my life. And if that happens, then there are no demands on me for constant loyalty and obedience um, to everything that God has put down. There's no display of my faith that's acting out. And sometimes if we present the other view, um, you know, that we experience the blessings of the new covenant through a faith that submits and loving obedience to Christ, then the world stands up and says, okay, well, you all are legalistic. You, you have a different view. Uh, but that isn't the case. For the true child of God, we don't seek to obey the Lord to obtain his blessings and his forgiveness. Instead, because we have already experienced forgiveness, because we have already experienced the blessings, we have a desire to show our love and our gratitude to our Lord, to our Savior, through a life that's filled with obedience. Listen to some of these verses from Jesus as he talked about this very thing. I'm going to give you four verses. We're going to be in the book of John. The first one is going to be John 14, 21. And this is Jesus. And he says, The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will also love him and reveal myself to him. You hear that? And one more time, I think that bears. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Two verses later in John 14, 23, again, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and will come to him and we will make our home with him. The next chapter in John 15, 10, again, Jesus says almost the same things. And he says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So not only is he repeated again, but he gives an example of how he lived his life and was obedient to his Father, even to the point of death. And then lastly, in John 15, verse 14, he says, you are my friends if you do what I have commanded. You know, we can't deny that pattern um, that's there. And I think that pattern is evident in our text tonight in Joshua 8, verses 30 through 35. Obedience, then, for us isn't the price that God demands to dispense his blessings to us. And I think we need to understand that. Obedience is the means that keeps open that never-ending river of grace that is flowing so that the blessings of the Lord can be fully experienced by a people that trust and obey. For us today, for us in, in relation and understanding, the fact of covenant, that covenant privileges require covenant obligations for us is fulfilled every time that we engage in the Lord's Supper. As redeemed children, when we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we do so, and we remember that everything that we have is a gift of God. Each time that we take communion, we are expressing our union with him. 
that he is in us and we are in him. And we're committing ourselves to be holy again because he is holy. But I got to tell you, we don't need to wait till that one Sunday a month to do that. Our altar that we have is the cross. And that's where the perfect sacrifice was made for us. That's where a sacrifice was made for all humanity that had no spot or wrinkle, that had no blemish. And that one through all sacrifice that established fellowship for all who would believe. And it established fellowship between them and God and between other like-minded believers. And we need to be at that altar, I'm going to tell you, every day uh, in our personal time with the Lord is as you sit down early morning, late morning, mid-afternoon, evening, whenever your personal time is, you, and you need to reclaim, we need to reclaim that forgiveness that he gave us. And we need to reaffirm our trust in his promises and his plans for our life and renew our commitment to be obedient to his commands that he gives us. You know, that's how God did it after the victory at Ai, right? The place of sacrifice became the place for covenant renewal. See, being a child of God isn't about engaging in some crazy spiritual games or you know, having some part-time religious interest when it suits us and being hot and cold and hot and cold. Being a child of God demands everything that we have and everything we are, and quite simply because it's impossible to be spiritually neutral. You know, we dare not, as we call ourselves Christians, and children of God, we dare not worship at our cross and then get up and go on living lives in disobedience because those two attitudes are diametrically opposed to one another. So instead, in our, our daily quiet time that we have with the Lord, let's do our covenant renewal with him. Let's seek him. Let's learn and desire to live in obedience. Even though we may stumble or fall along the way, remember, if our lives are characterized by faith and repentance, God is indeed with us and walking with us. And in, we can see through this that God is wholly committed to all who would trust and obey in him. And then his victories will become our victories. I pray that as you leave today, that you take away, then you need to renew your covenant, that we need to renew our covenant daily in our quiet time with the Lord and seek to live lives that reflect our trust and our obedience. I'll pray for us and then we can go. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Uh, and Father, I pray that you continue to pour out the faith to us to allow us to trust and obey, to be obedient and to seek to consistently renew our, our commitment to you to be obedient children, to shine our light in a lost and dying world. We pray all this in Christ's most precious name. Love y'all. Hope to see y'all soon. Have a blessed week, and I will see y'all Sunday morning.